Uh, well, oh. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone, um, and thanks for attending. This is the first EV roundtable session for 2022, um, and as you are probably aware, this has been a great partnership between Bonneville Environmental Foundation and Forth um, to have these quarterly roundtables and focus on different issues um, in relation to transportation, electrification, and electric vehicles. Um, we started these in November of 2020, uh, and then uh, did four roundtables last year, and we covered topics um, like managed charging and fleet electrification. Um, we had some excellent presentations from Atlas EV Hub and SEPA. Um, and today we're going to talk about all things DC fast charging. Um, and I'll just mention, um, uh, this is just one of a handful of uh, partnerships with Forth and BEF. Um, we've also worked on the electric tractor project. We've um, worked on uh, an EV car sharing platform and network that has grown significantly over the last year or so. Um, and then generally BEF um, is, is interested to be a resource for all of the consumer owned utilities, about 120 utilities in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Western Montana, um, and even one in Wyoming that we've been working with recently um, to help with any interest and ideas you've got around I did. Okay. Around transportation so electrification uh, and demand response, um, some of that is technical assistance or just conversations and help connecting dots, and some of that is actual grant dollars. Um, many of you will be um, familiar with the, the Zero Emission Vehicle Innovation Grant Program that we ran for the second time this year, and we recently awarded um, twelve uh, projects um, in in five states. So we we're really happy with the response we got to that program and the projects were excellent. Uh, and so with that, I will, um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley here and then we will get right into the program. Perfect, thank you so much, Thomas. My name is Ashley Duplanty. I'm the Senior Manager of Strategic Partnership. Hi guys. At Forth. Um, thrilled to be partnering with BEF for the second year running on these roundtables and look forward to seeing many of you um, and our future discussions throughout the year. Um, and Thomas invited me to say a few words. Um, we are excited to um, see and interact with you online, but I would like to extend an invitation to the fourth roadmap conference, which will be in person this June 29th through 30th here in Portland, Oregon. Um, Roadmap is the leading electric shared and smart mobility conference in the US. Um, and what makes it so unique in this space is that it truly brings the entire ecosystem of transportation and electrification stakeholders together. So you know, big um, number of, of utilities attending, we have the automakers, charging station firms, professional service firms like engineering, um, government agencies, all the way up from cities to federal government representatives, as well as startups and other engineers in the space um, and shared mobility firms. So we've got a um, couple days of content on um, lots of networking opportunities and you know, really just an excellent place to make connections, find new partners, um, as well as learn a little bit more about the best practices and upcoming trends in transportation electrification. So hope to see you all there. And I do want to give a shout out. Um, all fourth members do receive a discount on their registration. And with um, considerations around COVID, while we are planning on in person, we have a generous cancellation policy. So if you reserve a ticket, um, decide you're not comfortable traveling, et cetera, we will give you a full refund um, uh, as of March 31st. And then after we will roll your ticket over to the following year. But hope you all can join us and look forward to continuing the conversation around how utilities can engage. It's going in reality. In real life, yes. <laughs> And it looks like we've got someone reminder to please mute. Um, I think Thomas, oh, back over to you. 
Uh, great. So I think um, we've got a couple of speakers here um, in the beginning, and then uh, we're going to have a conversation um, around DC fast chargers toward the end. So I think we're going to start with, with Jeanette Shaw from Forth and um, talking about some developments on the policy front that relate to um, transportation electrification and EVs. Great. Thank you, Thomas. And I'm really excited to be here with my fellow panelists, Jennifer Harper, as well as Clint Washburn. And I've been uh, happily tasked with providing just a very high level overview of some of the historic transportation electrification funding opportunities that are now available at the federal level. So I'll give a little bit of background um, and then likely we'll drop some things into the chat, some links but also my contact information. So if there's any follow-up questions as I may need to leave slightly early today, I'll be happy to reach out and answer any questions you may have. So again, thank you, Thomas. And as most of you know, last year uh, was a very historic year for investments in transportation electrification, primarily because of uh, President Biden signing the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, or as some of us call it, the IIJA for short. And that was signed on November 15th of 2021. And really it is mentioned, as I mentioned, providing this historic investment in the nation's infrastructure with regards to transportation, transportation electrification, rail and transit, clean energy, broadband and water, really just to name a few. But today, for purposes of this webinar, I'm going to be focusing on transportation and transportation electrification in particular, and with regards to the IIJA and the investment that it will provide for charging infrastructure nationwide over the next five years. Um, as most of you probably have read by now, there is a $5 billion formula funding program, which is called the NEVI, as some of us call it in short, but it's the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Corridor Charging Program. And there was also the announcement of the 2.5 billion discretionary grant program. Guidance has come out with regards to the 5 billion NEVI program and we're waiting for guidance on the 2.5 billion grant program. We expect that to happen in the fall of 2020, 20, uh, likely 2022, so this fall. Um, in regards to uh, most of the funding um, that was provided, there was also the establishment of the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. My understanding is the first time there has been a joint office that was created, and it's between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation at the U.S. level. And really, they are tasked with studying the planning, the coordination, the implementing of the zero emission vehicle charging and refueling infrastructure and um, strategy as well as supporting renewable energy generation storage and the electric, uh, electrical grid infrastructure. And the, this is a requirement for the joint office to establish and maintain a public database, which I think many of us are gonna be able to avail ourselves of because it's gonna be very important data. And that will um, also include um, several information about geolocations, about where charging stations are located, um, and a number of other criteria such as identifying eligible entities that can avail themselves of program funding. So uh, Forth works quite closely with this joint office. And again, happy to answer any questions if you're unclear about some of the regulations or some of the information that they have provided. Uh, most of the funding as um, probably you've seen will be provided and going directly to the state transportation department of, um, well, state department of transportation. So let's say in Oregon's case is gonna go through ODOT in Washington through WISDOT. And as most of us are know, we're very fortunate here in the Pacific Northwest that our transportation departments um, have been focused uh, quite strongly on charging and the transportation electrification network. And we've also been fortunate because we have the West Coast Electric Highway that extends from the California border all the way up to the Canadian border. And so we have um, agency personnel within the Department of Transportation who are fairly well versed when it comes to, if not very well versed when it comes to transportation electrification. So very excited about that opportunity um, and you know, we, I would encourage 
uh, most of you, if you haven't already, to reach out to your Department of Transportation staff, either within the governor's office of your states or Department of Transportation, because they will have a point person for IIJA, and they can answer um, any questions you may have about the funding opportunities or direct you, to, direct you directly to those individuals. Fourth is also going to have a list of those individuals, so again, we'd be happy to make that introduction. Um, and just quickly um, noting that, of course, we're focused on Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, um, really with NEVI is where I'm going to focus, that's the uh, 5 billion, it is really to create a seamless national network for public EV charging that is supposed, that will be, not supposed to be, it's going to be, reliable, convenient, affordable, and equitable, and with the emphasis on equitable to ensure that the historically disadvantaged communities can also um, avail themselves of these opportunities. And within those key federal requirements, there's really three I'd like to highlight. Uh, one is that the charging is supposed to be located along designated alternative fuel corridors. And it may be a little too long of a list today, but I do have the list of um, corridors for the states we're talking about today, as well as those pending. But again, happy to share those on um, the chat. But those um, really the along the designated alternative fuel corridors, the requirements are every 50 miles that there be a charger. Now there is an opportunity to apply for an exception because as we know in the West Coast Electric Highway, we may not need it every 50 miles. So there are opportunities to apply for an exception. And the minimum is really four high powered 150 kilowatt chargers at each site. Um, as I mentioned, it's there, the chargers are supposed to be along all the designated alternative fuel corridors. And really the first schedule for NEVI is that the guidance, it's been released. There's a 180 day minimum standards and requirements that is going to be um, put forth on May 13th. That'll help all of us who are working with our DOTs to determine what are the standards, what are the requirements and what are they looking for for the NEVI. Um, in addition, um, in a very short time frame, the state plans have to be developed and coordinated and submitted on August 1st to the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation at the federal level. So we have not a lot of bandwidth here, not a lot of runway to actually get these plans developed. So I would also, um, I would encourage you to get in touch again with your Department of State IIJA coordinators to exactly find out how you can participate because this is an opportunity with a short window. And again, fourth would be happy to assist. Um, have a number of other uh, questions we get frequently asked. So looking towards Ashley to see how my timing is going. I was speeding up purposely to fit a lot in. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. No, you've got plenty of time. Okay, great. So uh, oftentimes too, we're asked questions about, you know, will e-bikes be included? That may be a question you all receive. Um, in cases of e-micromobility, it's not necessarily included within the NEVI program, but of course, a number of opportunities, um, a number of Department of Transportation are looking at opportunities to perhaps avail themselves and the chargers, making them available to micromobility. So they're looking at with a lens of submitting the plans, but they also could be jointly done and perhaps even developed with micromobility in mind. Also, um, you know, the EV stakeholders, a lot of the different states are putting together stakeholder advisory groups. So if there is, I'd highly recommend you sign up with your respective uh, DOTs at your state level to receive information. Here in Oregon, uh, that would be the TINA, T-E-I-N-A, listserv, which is, um, it was a study that the state of Oregon had funded to really look at where charging should be placed throughout the state of Oregon. And there they'll put information about um, NEVI updates. And so that's a helpful, and I'm sure most other states will have the same listservs. The other is, will NEVI include commercial transit vehicles? And the guidance within NEVI has really been exclusive for light duty charging stations, which we'll be speaking to about today. And there is going to um, be a designation for freight corridors, but there is no indication currently right now that that guidance will direct us to spend money on medium and heavy duty um, with these funds or other funding sources. So right now it's really looking at the lens of light duty charging stations. 
Um, we have had some conversations uh, with FHWA and with freight uh, with regards to freight corridors, and we are anticipating that there's going to be a future funding opportunity in this area, just given the amount of CO2 that's also emitted by uh, transportation um, uh, entities, whether it's trucking or medium heavy duty. So that's another question we often get. Um, and with that, why don't I turn it over and leave some additional questions that may come up, uh, Ashley, in the chat. Also, I just, I might add, maybe we can tack on here a little bit. Um, uh, Jeanette, if, if you know some details or, or maybe Jenny can chime in, but on the state policy level, you know, um, Oregon's had a clean fuels program now for the last five years or so, and uh, Washington passed what looks to be a similar program in the last legislative session. I think it's, from what I've heard, it should be live uh, sort of January, early next year. Um, maybe Jeanette or, or Jenny, if you could speak to kind of the, um, what we might see um, as opportunities for that, for that program. Sure, perhaps I could start and then, uh, Jennifer, if you wanna jump in. But uh, within Oregon, we've had had the Clean Fuels Program. It's been quite a successful program managed by the Department of um, Environmental Quality, DEQ. And it um, has provided those who have credits, well, with regards to charging, you can avail yourself of credits and you can turn around and those credits can be sold and that generates revenue for those who have opted in. Um, so utilities who have opted in, they can spend that on transportation electrification um, within their districts, or at least that's what we're hoping they're gonna spend it on. The program also established a backstop aggregator. So if there are utilities who didn't avail themselves of those credits, those credits were captured and they could be utilized also for transportation electrification programs throughout the state. Um, recently, the uh, Washington legislature did pass similar clean fuels legislation. It's going through uh, promulgation of rules through the Department of Ecology, and they're doing uh, right now listening sessions. And so there's an opportunity to engage in the state of Washington with their clean fuels program. We are hoping they set up a similar, uh, whether you're called a backstop aggregator or a clean mobility fund, that will be a statewide uh, fund that will help with education and outreach on transportation electrification, technical um, questions about charging infrastructure, but again, that those dollars would um, go to both the utilities within their districts and others that are credit um, creating credit. So turning it over to Jennifer, if she had additional questions. Um, I've, I've just been following the rulemaking as much as I uh, as I can. I know that they're still accepting comment. Um, I don't recall the exact date that the cutoff is, but I know it was in August. I uh, believe that was correct about a January start date. Um, Dude, then I, fucking... I know that um, it will have a you know, positive impacts for owners of charging stations, for utilities. Um, so go, I told you I have a meeting from one to three. Bye. Um, the, um, excuse me. I know that with the onset of this, uh, some gas station owners have actually become much more interested in electric vehicle charging. So sort of offset what their, um, what, the opposite of the credits, um, how that'll affect them. And so um, I think ultimately that's that's good because um, as as many gas stations there are, they, that can also be good places for um, fast chargers to get installed. So I'm just um, paying as close attention to it as I can. So I know that how it will affect us as charging station owners and um, the utilities that we work with as well. So um, also, I see one question here in the chat, maybe for Jeanette. Um, I'm not sure the, the location of the, um, of the utility, but they said, if you already have a fast charger in your territory, if the federal policy is to have you know, these fast charging sites every 50 miles, um, if you already have a fast charger, does that disqualify you from, from participating or getting another set of fast chargers in your community? My understanding does not, but I've noted the question, so I'm going to um, 
check in with the joint office and make sure what the parameters are for that. Because I don't think it would disqualify, but there may be um, a reason to add. And I think I did hear you say that the that the this um, sort of the standard for the for this um, funding is that each site would have a minimum of four 150 kW fast chargers, which right. um, I would expect many of the chargers that are out there already are not that uh, powerful. They're, you know, the um, the West Coast Electric Highway chargers 10 years ago were all 50 kW. So, um, so that, that might be a consideration as well. And I'll get back to, um, I've noted it, and I know we're gonna have the ability to, um, not only are we recording it, but provide answers to those asking questions. So we'll follow up. Great. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, I think we are going to hand it off here to John Jantz, um, who is um, going to give us an overview of some work that he's doing on DC fast charging. Uh, and John, I'll let you give your, your, your intro and, and tell us about the work that you've been doing. Thanks, Thomas. Well, good to see everybody. Um, and thanks for that, uh, that great rundown on federal funding, Jeanette, that was fantastic. So some of you know me from, gosh, I used to help host these a handful of years ago with Ford, and I work with rural utilities in the Northwest. I'm, I'm based in Washington, but also across the country, I work with rural electric co-ops. And with my partners at EESI, they're a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., do a lot of policy work, but also a lot of rural electrification work. We've created a toolkit to help folks uh, navigate, you know, getting, getting buy-in from the management and from the board of why, you know, the rationale to do a build an electrification program. And I'm gonna focus obviously specifically on transportation electrification here and DC fast charging. And so as part of this toolkit, we basically built a whole bunch of different resources for how you go about building a program and all the nuts and bolts for the practitioners for y'all at Utility uh to build up your own TE program and you know and as we all know like this industry is changing really fast year to year you know it's it's a whole different ball game in a lot of ways so we're going to go through some uh basic best practices for dc fast charging and kind of how we think about framing it and and then after that we're going to have a discussion about some the field knowledge uh from some folks here so i'll share my screen You all see this here. Awesome. So let's move down to, you know, it's all pretty basic here, but I like to frame it. So we all are thinking on the same terms and same language here, you know, where we think about different levels of charging. Uh, dwell time is one of the great concepts to kind of think about, right? Is how long is somebody going to sit there? And if they're at a grocery store or at a movie, like that's one thing, um, you know, if they're at home, or they're at work, like that's a different sort of charging that we see. And so, you know, today we're specifically talking about these, what it takes to connect highways. And, you know, the kind of gold standard for that is, is roughly a, a 20 minute charge, you know, depending on the car, there's uh, cars have changed pretty rapidly, you know, in the early days when it was the Nissan Leaf, the Bolt, and some Teslas like S and X's, like we mainly saw 50 kW chargers for the, the non-Tesla vehicles. And then, you know, we watched Tesla basically have roughly, depending on the year, 75, 80% of the whole market share. And <clears throat> where their, their standard eight years ago in 2014 was four ports and 150 kW each. And now they're actually upgrading those to be a minimum of eight ports and 250 kW. And, and word on the street is that's gonna be upgraded further in, in the coming year, whatever Tesla time you wanna to assign to something. So anyways, uh, looking at how in rural America, you know, we've, a lot of people didn't have vehicles. There weren't a lot of vehicle options for folks in rural areas. And it's a really exciting time for co-ops and, and PDs because Finally, hey, there's going to be pickups and SUVs that people are interested in and, and want to drive, right? That can serve as their main vehicle. So one of the things to consider here is a lot of these vehicles have, you know, electric pickup truck 
a lot of them have pretty big batteries. For example, the Chevy Silverado and the Hummer have a 200 kilowatt hour battery. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, with a 50 kW charger, you know, it would take you three and a half hours to get to 80% or four hours to charge. And so it's more like a, a level two charger. Um, you know, and it's it's expensive to to build higher power levels. There's a lot of, as we all know, demand chargers can dominate in uh, the early days of this. So rate structures and some some reform, you know, with perhaps a demand charge holiday for a period where you phase it back in or or different ways of uh, attacking that few rate structures are important so you don't kill off fast charging its infancy. Um, but I think you know co-ops and, and PDs and munis are all in a really good place because we saw a similar thing happen nearly a century ago that necessitated the need for consumer and utilities where investor and utilities didn't go into these places with lower utilization, less density, right? And that's a, a similar problem we have in the fast charging space where a lot of our private entities, you know, they, they need that density and that start seeing utilization rates climb pretty quickly. And that's that's tough to do in a rural area. So uh, consumer owned utilities are really well positioned where you know we're advocates for co-ops and, and munis and PDs owning charging infrastructure. And as Jeanette's mentioned, there's funding available now um, through RUS Rural Utility Service. There's uh, some great loan funding that you can also apply towards charging infrastructure. It's geared, it's the Rural Energy Savings Program. And I can post a link in a bit in the chat, but there's approximately $200 million annually available through this program for energy efficiency programs or but anything attached to a structure. So charging, whether it's you know a school bus depot, uh, anything like that, even home charging, you know, level two charging, like you can help uh, offset those costs and electrical costs to the consumer. And we can do that same deal with DC fast charging to kind of stack revenue streams on top of each other here. And I think that's really important. And, you know, like Jeanette was getting into, it's, it's really, really key to reach out to the folks at your state DOT, uh, your, your state energy office, who can really be good partners with you here. And like, for example, Washington State right now has, um, you know, a good chunk of money available through ZVIP grants. And uh, those have really helped, we're here from Jenny a little while, really helped build out networks across the state. And so working with those folks at, at state agencies is, is really important. Uh, Washington also is building out a joint agency like the federal government is to you know, help plan for this infrastructure and kind of think of this more strategically. There's also gonna be money coming out from our Department of Commerce as well. So uh, it, it's really good to, to be in the loop, but I know, gosh, at a lot of consumer utilities, you know, folks wear 10 hats and are overworked and you do a lot of stuff. And so it's it's tough to stay on top of all that stuff. And that's why there's great resources like folks at Four, EF. You know, I, I also do this sort of work where I work with rural utilities and help people stay in the loop, right? Because there's a lot going on. So anyways, uh, another thing to think about is like Jeanette mentioned is alt fuel corridors is where a lot of this federal levy money, the formula funding is targeted at those. And a lot of the co-ops and, and smaller rural utilities are off of these main highway corridors. Some certainly serve these, but it's there's another reason to be in touch with the folks at your state DOT and have conversations to help throw the kitchen sink at these lists to Colorado a handful of years ago submitted, gosh, I believe it was you know, close to 20. It was in the high teens of alt fuel corridors and didn't get all of them approved right away. They had some discussion with the feds, went back and forth, but that really helped them build out a charging network through the state. And I think that's really important here too, where you know, even though there is a bucket of money devoted to uh, rural areas in this, in the seven and a half billion dollars total, you know, it's, it's still important to, if you can have some of these highways that, you know, serve your customers and even customers from urban areas in your state, uh, if we can get more of these as all designated as alt field corridors, it'd be really helpful where there's that guaranteed funding stream coming in from the federal government. Um, 
so some some basic best practices you know i think utilities are really well positioned to own charging infrastructure because you, you all understand uptime and reliability been keeping the lights on for a century right and this is a big problem in this industry where lots of people you know go out to a place where there's maybe one or two charging ports somewhere in a lonely spot and lo and behold it doesn't work and somebody gets stuck and that's the last thing we want right and so uh we really believe that rural utilities are well positioned to help address this problem uh and and also you know your engineers and distribution planners are really good at figuring out like okay well where do we have capacity on our system you know to be able to serve these power levels you know as we've been talking about 600 kW is now the the new basic standard of you know the the floor and as we've seen in Colorado they've really connected their state with 150 kW but also a lot of 350 kilowatt chargers which like we talked about earlier really helps enable pickups to charge you know in a reasonable amount of time rather than sitting there for hour two three hours um, so those are some of the main points uh, you know it's also important to be in these discussions like Jeanette mentioned for regional collaboration like with the folks in your state and you know maybe you border another state and there's you know obviously you know we don't have these hard borders from state to state and so we want to be thinking on this regional level and how we can all work together and collaborate um yeah so i guess i would just emphasize dwell time is really important if you're thinking about you know helping helping connect these highways and making evs a reality in a rural area for vehicles with big batteries um, and that's a good bit of it. And, and I'm thinking about stacking different funding streams here. And I think we can touch more on some of these areas in the discussions. I, I would love to hear as we get into the discussion phase of this from some of you in Oregon of how you've, you know, seen clean fuels dollars, you know, positively impact, uh, you know, money coming in for fast chargers and experiences like that. So, all right. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll kick it back to Thomas here. Excellent. Um, well, we do. We certainly have a couple minutes for questions here. Um, and I see one question from Bill, Bill Separito out at Umatil Electric Co-op um, asking if you could discuss the limitations um, that vehicles have regarding charging capacity. Um, so maybe you could just talk a little more about sort of the different sizes of vehicles and different battery sizes and and the different, you know, um, power rates on on DC fast chargers in particular. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, this runs the gamut as this industry is developing quickly. We still have, uh, for example, the Chevy Bolt is limited to 50 kW and it's kind of, you know, it was first built as a compliance car, as an earlier vehicle, and it's almost an antique now in EV years. It's almost like 50 years old, right? <laughs> and and then we have on the other end of the spectrum, the Chevy Silverado and the, the Hummer EV. Uh, and those have an 800 volt system, which can charge at 350 kilowatts. So they really pack a punch and can pull up to a charger and, and take in a lot of energy quickly. And in between that, uh, we also have vehicles with smaller batteries, like the new Hyundai Ioniq 5 and its cousin, the Kia AV6. And they are the first vehicles to actually outcompete Tesla for charging speed. So at a 350 kW charger, uh, they can reach 80% state of charge in roughly 18 minutes. You know, this is ideal conditions with not too cold, not too hot, different things like that. And and vehicles kind of run the gamut in between that. So I believe the new, you know, Ford's vehicles are still around 150 kW, but the rumor would be upgrading those soon. Uh, Rivian, their pickup can do about 200 kW on a 350 kilowatt charger that puts out enough amperage. So yeah, it really depends on the vehicle right now, but the trend is definitely moving upwards and quickly to necessitate, you know, the, or to help enable that faster recharge time that, you know, more closely approximates a gas stop when you're out on the highway. Can, can I elaborate on that question or actually ask a follow-up question that, that may help uh, somebody like me with, with my board of directors and, and, and kind of selling them, so to speak, these programs? I, you know, it's it's interesting that the car companies are actually recognized well time and they, they really need to make it equivalent to, to a fueling stop, right? Um, but for me to say that, I don't know 
what cars have what, you know, charging like you just described. And it would be great to understand what these companies are marketing as far as the Ionic 5. They expect 5,000 of these to be on the road by 2025 or something like that. And if, if there was some kind of material that was available to me that had a list of the vehicles that were actually coming out and the list of these charge times, it would be able, I'd be able to say to my board, well, you know, you don't have to sit there for two hours because here's the number of vehicles expect to be sold in an area and here's the charge time for those. I, mean, I don't know if that information is out there, but like somebody else mentioned, I'm pulled in about 42 directions right now as far as what I do. And I just don't have the time to keep up on all that stuff. So that kind of information would, and is this somebody helping me out? Yeah, yeah. yes. So uh, I was referring to this toolkit earlier and I apologize that this thing isn't live yet. Um, so, but it's, it's a public facing website uh, developed in collaboration with NRECA and the Beneficial Education League. And so uh, I think that's a, a great addition. You know, some of these aren't public yet, of, of charge times, but I will add that in here. And, you know, maybe on a, a future roundtable event, this will be live in a couple of weeks. And I can I can send this to uh, Thomas and, and Connor and they can send that out to the group here uh, as soon as this is live. But yeah, we this is kind of one of the points of this toolkit is since you don't have time to go out and do all this legwork yourself, uh, and we know you wear 10 hats and you're doing, you know, 100 different things at once, uh, why don't try and make it easy? So put that information in here. And I think that's a great addition. So, and- Thank as, you very much. That, that would be very helpful. Absolutely. And, and also I should say on top of that, once we do launch this, I would love to hear feedback from you all because you are the ones in the trenches doing this. So anything and everything you need, you know, we're here to help. Thank you. John, one quick question, clarification. Uh, you talked about, you know, these different, levels of, of DC fast chargers, 50 kW, 250 kW, 350 kW, and something like the Chevy Bolt or the Nissan Leaf, they're limited, right? They, they can't charge beyond 50 kW. And that limitation, is it, is it onboard electronics? Is it software? What is it that's limiting those vehicles and not limiting Teslas or, or F-150 Lightnings or larger vehicles like that that are new? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So it's generally a hardware limitation on the vehicle, you know, in the case of the, the Chevy Bolt and the Nissan Leaf. Some vehicles uh, have the capability to, to basically up the ante there and, and may be able to do that through software. So it, that, once again, sorry for you know, a complex answer, nuanced answer, but it depends on the vehicle. Some, you know, Ford is rumored to be upgrading this via software in the future. Uh, Rivian, it, is you know rumored to be upgrading their charge capacity. Um, some there is an upper bound when you're on a, a CCS charger that if your 400 volts are architecture on the vehicle you, and they're limited to 500 amps on CCS, there is an upper upper bound like that. And Rivian's approaching that. That's why GM and Hyundai and Kia went to an 800 volt architecture to speed that up. Tesla does things a little differently. Obviously, they're, they have different limits and they don't vocalize that a bunch, but supposedly they're going up to 325-ish, you know, above 300 soon. Excellent. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, and if we don't have any other questions for John at the moment, um, we're going to move into uh, the next session here. Um, which is a little different than what we've done in the past. So um, I want to welcome Jenny Harper from Energy Northwest and Clint Washburn from um, Fall River Electric Co-op in Idaho. Jenny's in Richmond, Washington, and Clint is in Ashton, Idaho, correct? Right. Yep. Um, and so we're going to try to do uh, more of a moderated discussion here. So, uh, and I'm, I'm going to moderate. So imagine instead of being on Zoom, you know, we're at a, a live conference and it's one of those nice stages with a couple of comfy chairs and Jenny and, and Clint and I are sitting on the stage and I'm going to try to uh, ask them a lot of different questions about um, some of the projects they're working on and their experience with DC fast chargers. And along the way, if anyone has questions, you're welcome to, to raise your hand um, if, you, if you'd like to, to speak your question or 
you're welcome to put some information in the chat. Um, and as always on these um, EV roundtables, we'll leave a few minutes, um, 10 or 15 minutes at the end where um, is really for um, different attendees to, to bring up um, questions or resources or um, other ideas for future EV roundtables, anything of that sort. So we can also um, throw, those, throw some questions in at the end. So um, to, to kick off here, I just, I wanna provide just a little bit of background, uh, some of, some more things um, that, that John was talking about, and then I'll, I'll have Jenny and Clint introduce themselves and, and we'll get into um, the discussion. Um, so just very, um, very base, base level, what John had mentioned, you know, when you're talking about EVs, we have level one, level two, and level three chargers. Level one at 110 volts, level two at 208 to 240, and then the level three chargers are the 480 three phase um, high speed DC fast chargers. And John talked about dwell time. You know, a level one charger, you might get four or five miles of, of range of charge for every hour that you have charge. For, for a level two, for a level two, you're talking it's in the safe 15 to 10. I mean, serious. I think I'm hearing a little um, bit of conversation. If you're not on mute, please, please mute. Yeah, um, what happens at CETL and that broke down? Um, level two charge, 15 to 20 miles for every hour you're on the charger. And with level one, the power, it can be 80 or, or many more miles in an hour, very, very fast charging. Um, most EV owners, their gas station is in their garage. Um, most of them are charging up on a level one or level two, and that's the, the most affordable way to do it. But level threes fill an important role um, for um, traveling, for people that are on the road and, and traveling highway miles and putting a lot of miles on the car in a day, or maybe high use um, vehicles like taxis. Um, we mentioned that the, the first group of DC fast chargers um, here in Oregon and Washington, I believe, were the West Coast Electric Highway. Um, which was installed about 10 years ago, um, 44 sites in Oregon, and I believe 15 sites in Washington. 12. 12. Current, go ahead. 12. 12 in Washington, okay. Um, and currently in Oregon, EV Charge Solutions is the owner of the system in Oregon, and they're upgrading all of those um, DC fast chargers currently. I think they were originally 50 kW chargers. Um, as John mentioned, more, more common these days are 150 kW to as high as 350 kW DC fast chargers. Um, it's worth noting, you know, the, the, the greatest amount of fast charging stations out there in the US are, are Tesla and Electrify America. Um, Tesla currently has 1,100 um, charging stations in North America, um, and that's up from just 119 in 2014. So they've built them out rather quickly. And, and Tesla has um, average of nine, nine stalls per station. Um, and John mentioned, you know, they're upgrading those to be a standard of 250 kW for Tesla. Um, Electrify America was, is a subsidiary of Volkswagen. Um, and they were created as a, as a response to the um, uh, emissions uh, evasion issue that they had a couple of years ago with their diesel vehicles. Um, there's currently 730 um, Electrify America sites um, they built out over the last five years. And they also are, they may be 50 kW, 150 kW, or 350. And we may also talk about um, DC fast charging. There is a Chatamo type adapter um, that is Nissan Leaf and I think maybe Mitsubishi. Um, and then the current standard that's becoming, you know, ubiquitous is the CCS um, charging standard. And then, of course, only Teslas can charge on Tesla fast charging stations um, currently, but Teslas can have an adapter that allows them to charge on um, other fast chargers. So, um, so that's just a little bit of background. So I, uh, at this point, I want to um, introduce um, Jenny and Clint and have them um, give their own intro about the organizations they represent and a little bit about their experience with, with DC fast chargers. Um, and I think I'd like to start with Clint. Okay. 
I'm Clint Washburn. I'm with Fall River Rural Electric Cooperative in Ashton, Idaho. We cover um, northeastern Idaho, parts of uh, Montana and Wyoming as well. Um, our my experience here, we bought a Tesla as a co-op about a year and a half ago. We've used it on a regular basis, taking it on road trips, just to get a feel for what the challenges are. Um, we have a Tesla supercharger in our territory, so we've kind of been able to see how that impacts things and kind of monitor the usage of it. And then I'm working on a few grants to uh, put some some fast chargers in our territory, and we're we're still kind of in the early stages of that. But uh, we've got some, uh, like for example, he uh, Tom mentioned we did uh, we were awarded the the BEF grant. And we're working on some state of Idaho grants, and now we're working on Montana as well um, to to get some chargers in our territory. Excellent. Uh, and Jenny, I'm Jenny Harper. I'm a project developer with Energy Northwest, and Energy Northwest is a joint operating agency in Washington State. Um, so we're a public uh, we're a public agency. We work uh, with. Uh, 27 member utilities, which include both um, public utility districts and municipal utilities. But we're also uh, working with other utilities that may, may not be our members, primarily uh, public utilities um, and communities throughout the state uh, in both rural and not, we have urban utilities, but we're focusing right now primarily on uh, rural electrification. Uh, with charging, but we've been in the space of EV charging since um, I think around the end of 2015, and um, we have uh, we received a grant from Washdot in 2017 that installed nine DC fast chargers, and then we're working on one from Commerce right now that uh, will install an additional eight, and we've received four small grants um, for individual sites uh, in rural areas in Washington State. So right now, um, by the time that we get the uh, White Pass project done, that'll be 20 sites um, that we are affiliated with, but we've got uh, probably 20 or 25 more that we say in the hopper that we're, we're um, continually looking for funding for. Um, and as you mentioned, um, BEF, um, through the Zavi program, we, we've awarded um, small grants to these DC fast chargers. Um, they are expensive, so they're small pieces, but I was hoping um, that you each could talk just a little bit about the, the specific Zevi grant, and we may refer back to those, those projects as we move through the conversation here. So Clint, you want to tell us about the, the project you're working on? Sure. So in the state of Idaho, the, the current uh, DEQ grants uh, opportunity, if if the, if the charger is going to be on private property, then the DEQ will only fund 80%. So we applied for the ZEVI grant to help kind of bridge that gap for that 20% that won't be covered. And um, we received that, but we're still waiting for the state of Idaho's portion. And that particular charger total cost on it's about 194,000. So, you know, that 20%, that, that's a big help. And I think is the funding through Idaho DEQ is a part of the Volkswagen settlement for the state of Idaho? Yep, exactly. Exactly, okay, great. And Jenny, you wanna talk about the, the specific project that you've got through Zevi? Yeah, so um, part of our, Part of what we were looking at was electrifying Highway 12, um, as it is, it runs completely east-west across the state of Washington, and um, several of the chargers from our WashDOT program were on Highway 12, and uh, the, the project we have funded from Commerce is along Highway 12, so um, we had always hoped to find a funding source for Walla Walla. Uh, Walla Walla is in eastern Washington, and it's a a uh, smaller community, but is like uh, Washington wine country is a very much a destination um, for a lot of travel. And um, there was a definite gap um, without any uh, fast charging in Walla Walla. And so 
we had partnered with Columbia Rural Electric Association to discuss a, a place for a DC fast charger and they um, offered to be a host site. And um, they were already doing some, um, some upgrades on their property to include some employee uh, and fleet charging. Um, and so it was, it was a good fit for us. So we um, applied for that from BEF. We'll put in a DC fast charger there at their property, which is um, near the airport and uh, Walla Walla Community College. And um, we're also able to combine that with a uh, Washington State Department of Revenue uh, tax credit tour, uh, for both uh, public utility tax or B&O tax. And so we are uh, submitting an application for that as well. So that um, can be good for up to 50% of the project costs plus the, the grant with uh, BEF is, is actually uh, equivalent to some of the other funding sources that we've received for other projects. So we're really excited about it, um, excited to get a fast charger in Walla Walla. So. Um, that would actually put uh, chargers every, about every 30 miles, at least uh, currently across Highway 12 from um, when we're, we're doing Natchez and when um, there's Yakima, we're doing one in Grandview, Prosser, Richland, Pasco, Walla Walla and Dayton. We we'll still have a little ways to go to get all the way to the Eastern border, but we're getting there. Well, that's excellent. That's such a that's that's really a rural corridor, and so it's it's fantastic that you've been able to get those put together and funded. Um, so I so we're talking about you know developing these DC fast charge sites, and so um, you know like any project development, um, for these you need you need an owner, you need someone that's going to own this, you need a site somewhere to put the put the equipment, you need the equipment itself. Um, obviously, these are these are grid connected um, chargers, so you've got to have a grid connection, and you have to have the the money to pay for it. And then, of course, these these sites should be good for about ten years. The equipment itself should be good for about ten years. So you've got ten years of operation, including whatever admin is required, um, back end software and billing, uh, O and M, and insurance, um, probably other things I've have left out. So I'd like to kind of walk through these one by one and, and get, some, um, get some feedback from Jenny and, and um, Clint. So um, ownership structure on, on these projects, the Zevi projects in particular, um, how, what, is, what is the ownership structure for these projects? Uh, for, for us, Fall River is gonna own and maintain it for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, as the utility, we, We've, you know, there's been opportunities for some of the cities we've talked to in the years past to do it, and but they just didn't see the the benefit for them to to do it. So we're just our plan is to do four or five in our territory, own and operate all of them. So, Jenny, um, for specifically for the one in Walla Walla, that will have Energy Northwest will own the charging station. Um, will be customers to the utility, um, pay for the electricity, and um, and then we'll actually lease the space from them. And that's the model that we're primarily using when we're looking at uh, station siting anywhere now. Um, then there are times when it may make more sense for either the site host to own or um, some, you know, I, I know in some cases the, uh, the, the equipment supplier prefers to own the equipment. Um, we haven't had, that was how the uh, original Washout grant that we got had, had that structure where Green Lots was the owner, we administered the grant, we ended up owning one of those sites, site hosts owned a couple others, but um, it kind of takes some um, it, it seemed like a less of a um, less of a risk if we owned it because then if you know we were responsible for for making sure that it's maintained if we're responsible for 
for making for compliance with grants and then you have somebody else that actually owns it it kind of took added another layer of complexity to it so um, it just seems to make more sense if we own the stations but we are also uh, think that in time in times where the utility prefers to own it and we work together to get it installed then that can make sense as well so um, I, mean, I think we'll get into funding here in a little bit but um Clearly, when these are so expensive, I think some of the grant programs are limited to public entities, so that that can be a, a limitation as well. Um, site selection, you talked about sites, and, and obviously you got to put these somewhere. Um, for Fall River, you guys are putting it at your office, so you, you have that. But Jenny, you've worked on a, a bunch of different projects. What are some important things to consider when you're trying to choose a site? So... Um... When you're setting out the route and you're trying to decide how far apart they should be, that kind of kind of gets you a starting, you know, maybe this town and then this town is another 50 miles or so from there. But um, want to make sure there's um, adequate access to three phase power or, um, you know, that you're working really close with the utility to ensure that is a, it, it is even a possibility. Um, there have been times when someone called and said, this is a great place and we really, we really want to work with you. We want to be a site host and do this and then realize that it would be near impossible to be, bring three phase power to it. So um, that's, that's the biggest consideration is is basically the cost and the capability of bringing three phase power. But then also wanting to make sure there is adequate amenities for the, the drivers, if they're gonna be there for any length of time, can they go use a, a restroom somewhere? Um, is it a safe location? Do they have to turn left across a busy highway to, where they have to cross the street in order to get, you know, and is that street a highway? Um, then does the site host have realistic expectations of, of what the, you know, their revenues might be from it? That's, I'm, I know later in the conversation, but, um, you know, sometimes what seems like a perfect spot is also prime real estate that may not really be um, realistic for the budget of the project. Um, then uh, do they have enough room for parking? and you know, putting in the equipment that takes up some of, you know, if, a, if it's a mini mart and they don't have that many parking spaces, it, it takes up a little more room than they might realize as a site host. So there's definitely a lot of uh, considerations. Um, sometimes it just comes and it's the perfect spot and that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> nice. you, you mentioned, you know, often um, space is leased if, if the project's owned by the utility or, or by a private vendor, you might lease uh, space. What would be a typical arrangement? Would it just be fee fee for the space, or is there some kind of commission type basis, or what are some arrangements? Um, I think that it's been a little bit different from um, charging station to charging station. Um, typically, what I've seen is a, a dollar per or a, a dollar amount per square foot per month that is agreed to between the site host and the um, station owner or a percentage of the revenues. Um, we've seen uh, a dollar amount per month per parking space. Um, we've seen some that want, you know, the, if it's a public agency that is hosting the site and they're not set up to receive revenues, then they might go into a really, really simple low dollar um, uh, structure but others where um, they, they have expectations that they're going to receive some revenues from the charging. And so we kind of have to take it on a case by case basis and, and run it through the, the model and expected usage and make sure that it works within the, the, um, the projections. So I, I can't probably say what a typical thing would be because it hasn't been typical. And I've asked, I've asked different, um, you know, network providers, if they can give me any ballparks for what they do and they're like very tight-lipped about it, so. <laughs> so a negotiation often to figure out yeah. what works. Um, so how about equipment? I know that, you know, um, there are a number of different vendors out there that sell DC fast chargers, um, different sizes of DC fast chargers. So maybe you could talk about the, um, 
the vendor you chose for your for your Zevi project and what maybe some of the things you thought about um, when you made that selection. Um, do you want to start? Sure. We, we looked at several different uh, charger manufacturers and vendors. Um, in the end, we ended up going with uh, a charger manufactured by, well, it's sold by NLX and uh, our, our contractor that we buy a lot of our utility materials, uh, you know, wires, transformers, all that sort of stuff. They are, they are a vendor for NLX and they had had some success at other utilities with them. So uh, that was who we went through. We found out that a lot of the chargers are made by the same manufacturer and just sold under different names. Um, and so the particular one that we chose, we wanted a large one. So they're 175 kW. Um, we wanted, you know, we wanted this location to be somewhere people would want to stop because of the, you know, the, the ability to quickly charge and get on their way. Um, here at our office isn't, you know, no one's coming here to visit or, uh, to, to sightsee there. It's, it's mainly going to, they're going to be stopping here to charge and move on. So that's how we ended up with them. And I think I recall it's a, it's a pretty powerful charger. It's actually liquid cooled yep. on on the equip on the DC fast charger side, right? Yep, that's correct. Yeah. So as you pump more higher amounts of power through those wires, they heat up, and you've got to have a way either on the charger side or on the vehicle side to to keep things within a, a reasonable range. Yep. Great, Jenny. What about what about for your project? So we we started by looking at what was available on both the Washington State Master Contract and um, Sourcewell, which is another. Um, um, ne negotiated or bidded uh, contract already. And so we had a few vendors that we've worked with previously that we uh, considered. And um, we selected Flow, uh, which uh, we actually have two other projects that we're working with them on. And we were just really familiar with them and their pricing. And because we, um, had initially thought about saving, you know, combining two grants with with that particular project, and decided that with the uh, with the tax credit and the BEF grant that um, it would it would be feasible. We're also trying to be economical as far as um, pricing, and, and and Flow had some really competitive pricing. But they also had um, the opportunity to do some. Um, demand response applications if if that becomes an issue or you know potential in the future but i would say primarily they're a pretty um, easy to work with had a good maintenance program had also um, intended to work with us to help train our own staff to be uh, to provide maintenance because that's um, something that we're we're developing right now for the future is um, as, as we'll have stations kind of throughout the state, we want to be able to respond to those ourselves. One of the more costly parts of um, operations for charging stations is the maintenance plans, so. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, O&M is certainly a consideration. Um, from the manufacturer also, um, I'm curious about warranties that they provide. And then also, you know, these chargers have a backend network for you know for reading credit cards and billing and moving money around. Um, can you speak to that a little bit about about a flow and NLX, what their policies are there? So, uh, with NLX, we have their own network called JuiceNet, and um, it's 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 like three hundred and almost four hundred dollars for a five year. Uh, subscription to that and then you have the data plan on top of that whether you you know we'll, we'll just pay for a cellular service to to do that where we're at rather than try to run a phone line um, the typical warranty that I saw when we were looking at them was uh, three-year parts only so you'd pay for labor still um, and in our area that you know, finding someone who can work on them, we're pretty remote. So uh, thinking of someone driving four hours to, to come fix it. Uh, so we, 
we want to, you know, our plan is to go ahead and pay for that, the extended warranty, and and so that would be covered. What about flow, Jenny? Um, I have to admit that right this week I've been working with uh, several different vendors and looking at different <laughs> different plans, and so I I might misquote exactly what theirs was, but I think it was a two year warranty with a three year you know that you could purchase a three year warranty on it. Um, they they actually had quite affordable maintenance plan in comparison to some of the others that we're looking at. Um, but I don't think it was as comprehensive, which went in line with, with us training our own staff. Um, the flow equipment also uh, believed that it had an embedded credit card reader where some equipment you have to purchase a credit card reader separately. Um, I could be wrong on that because like I said, I've been looking at a lot of different pieces of equipment this week, but they, they do have a, um, a system which, uh, we can log in and see data use and revenues and um, energy consumption and you know you name it there the the graphs are there and then we can uh, download the raw data also to create our own reporting mechanisms um, but that's that's pretty typical with any of the vendors um, they all offer that um, try to think what you else you ask for so the so the charge manufacturer has the the credit card network and they they do all the billing and then transfer revenue to the owner. Yeah. So they uh, and sometimes when there's a, a credit card processing that that's another piece that's kind of on the they kind of handle on that side. But yeah, in the case of specifically what primarily we have in operations right now is on the Green Lots network, and so yeah the the consumer pays green lots and green lots then pays us. There is a fee um, and all of them have a slightly different fee. Uh, some of them it's 9%, some it's 10%. Uh, it's kind of, you know, kind of fluctuates, but um, so they, they transfer that on a monthly basis per station. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and there's all kinds of factors too about <laughs> usage, you know, weather, COVID, um, different events, you know, um, holidays, whatever, it all has an effect on, on usage. Right, that's, that's something John Chance mentioned is, you know, utilization and um, in Oregon, the, the uh, West Coast Electric Highway, there are some sites, you know, getting from, from Eugene to Bend, for example, that might've only seen on average one charge a week. And of course, you know, you're not gonna generate revenue enough revenue to pay for these expensive chargers with that. So that's a consideration uh, if you're not 100% grant funded, for example. Um, the utilization is, is important. And um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, 80% of the vehicle of the EVs on the road are Teslas, um, which makes a big case for Tesla superchargers. They're, they're uh, you know, they're, they're um, providing that service to, to those vehicles. Over time, we'll see more and more um, non-Tesla electric vehicles, but it does take time for that to, to, to ramp up. Um, on the, uh, so getting to, you know, project costs, um, you, you both mentioned, you know, um, the, the total, total cost of your project and the ability to uh, make those pencil and the different funding sources. I, we've talked about it a little bit, but do you want to talk about a little bit more about you know, how, how these can actually pencil out or if they really need to be heavily grant funded. You wanna start, Jenny? Um, I would say that prior to learning about the, this um, Department of Revenue tax credit, which is, is great if you have the tax liability. If you, if you don't, you will, you're only able to apply it to as many stations as you have liability for. So that was really helpful. Um, any amount of grant funding is helpful, but um, we what we were looking at is that with conservative usage projections, we needed to get at least 50% uh, grant funding for the pro each individual project or it would not work out. 
And, and we were basing our usage projections on what we'd seen at similar locations. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to take usage on I-5 and apply it to what I might expect to see in Dayton, Washington. But I also wouldn't take Dayton, Washington and apply it to what I might see in, um, say, oh, Kennewick even has a different you know, usage projection. So, so we're trying to, to go conservative based on you know, traffic counts and, and location and you know, weather, like I said, uh, as well. But sometimes they surprise you. Um, but yeah, I would say definitely need to get grant funding. And, and some of these programs have great grant opportunities, but they, that kind of takes a little bit of the risk out because um, the, the sizing requirements, like we talked about earlier with the four 150 kW chargers, to put that in a, in a rural location that I wouldn't have expected to get more than one use a day, it would definitely need a lot of grant funding to justify it. You have, have thoughts to add on that? So in our area, um, you know, with the Tesla supercharger in our territory, we've been able to kind of monitor it and how much usage it's seeing. And knowing that, like you said, about 80% of the EVs on the road are Teslas. Um, without grants covering, you know, almost, you know, it's got to be close to 100% in our area today. So we're speculating on what the future will bring and, um, you know, how many years we're going to get out of these chargers and those sorts of things. So um, they definitely, in our area, where we're so rural and um, don't have many EVs other than a couple months in the summer when people are coming to West Yellowstone. Um, we're, we're just kind of building for the future at this point. They, they don't pencil out yet. It's, uh, it's just hopes. It's kind of, if you build it, they will come, right? It's, is it chicken or egg? It's both at the same time, right? Exactly. Well, I guess yep. you can't have vehicles if you don't have fueling infrastructure, so. Yep. And, and I guess the other thing that, that I would add is, um, you know, I had to present to our board last month about what we were doing, what we were planning, and there were a lot of questions. And most of the board didn't realize you can't charge a non-Tesla EV at a Tesla charging station. Several board members were like, we, we already have one in our territory. What are we doing? Like, well, that, that kind of doesn't fit the bill of what we need. Excellent. Um, I see here in the chat, I think, um, uh, John Jance mentioned that there is also federal money to help um, with the grid infrastructure um, for these. Jenny mentioned, you know, having access to three-phase power, but there's also, you know, potential line extensions, all the make-ready work that has to be done. So, um, John, you want to mention specifically how that funding relates to to, um, to infrastructure? Grid yeah. Grid? yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, just real quick, you know, I could be getting this wrong off the top of my head, but I believe it's roughly, it's close to $80 billion for that piece in the infrastructure bill. And there's a lot of different buckets within it. You know, some of them are energy storage. It's, it runs the gamut of, of grid upgrades, but um, there's a lot of money there that makes the charge infrastructure dollars like pale in comparison. So definitely be good for utilities to be looking at that as a potential funding source too. And I also, sorry, I forgot to mention earlier that uh, you know, in rural areas, towing is, is certainly going to be a thing, right? So thinking about that and site design of having some sites that are pull-through sites that can accommodate that. And Clint, would you, I know you can't share customer data, but could you give us an idea of usage that you see on these Tesla superchargers? Because I was just, I was looking earlier today on uh, one in central Washington on the east side of the mountains and there were four cars charging, this is a 250 kW charger in Leavenworth. Um, four ports were occupied at 11 o'clock on, on a Thursday morning, you know, before people come from Seattle over the mountains. And yeah, any experience there that you see sure. from Tesla site? So the, the site in West Yellowstone, Montana, there are 150 kW chargers and there's eight of them. Um, we, we put a 500 kVA uh, transformer on there. So if you do the math, that that's technically not big enough if all those were to be plugged in at the same time. But, you know, the way they work, and we see this with our Tesla when we go to charge, 
it ramps up, it charges really fast for the first five minutes or so, and then it tapers off. So um, that, that site there, um, I, you know, I pulled the data it, in some months, the busiest uh, in the summer, uh, we're seeing 40 to 50,000 kilowatt hours in a month. Um, on our system, we've implemented a demand charge. And so there's a demand fee at the beginning of the month. So whatever the peak demand was the previous month. And so the peak on that one has been around 480, 480. So, I mean, that's the most we've seen at one time out of that charger. So it's seen quite a bit of use in the, in the summer months, but in the winter months, it's maybe 10% of that. That's, that's great. And that's, sorry, that's something I admitted earlier in my introduction is I should have mentioned that when we're looking at chargers, um, you know, if, if you have four times 150, like the way most are built is they power share. And it used to be Tesla on their system, they shared between two pairs. So it was, if you park right next to somebody, you're going to drop the power levels. And now on the new V3s, they share in sets of four. So even though their minimum install is four by 250, you know, you're not seeing, or excuse me, not four, but eight by 250, uh, you're not seeing two megawatts on the system. Because, no. and like you mentioned, a charging curve, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time to ramp up. I was going to show one of these pretty graphs in the presentation, I didn't, but you know, then you'll charge it close to your max if the battery's not too hot or not too cold. And then as you near 60, you know, 50, 60, 70%, depending on the car, it starts tapering. And by 80, some of them really drop off, like the Mustang Mach-E was dropping off really, really low. So something to think about too, is you don't need the power to support all those charging at max at the same time because they're sharing power and it's distributed. Excellent. Um, well, it looks like we have just a little over 10 minutes left. And I, this has been a great discussion. Thank you, Jenny and, and Clint. And I'm hoping maybe we've, we've uh, inspired some questions. Um, and if you have a question, you could raise your hand or just come off mute, or um, you're welcome to put questions into the chat box. So any questions for anyone? And if not, we can also open the floor to just any other any other um, uh, ideas, um, resources, or ideas for future roundtables, or um, anything like that that people might want to share to this group. I don't think Thomas, question. Oh, go ahead. Thanks, John. Hey, Thomas, this is Juan from Ewa. I had a question for Clint. Yes. Hi, Clint. Um, you mentioned that the stations that you have, they have their own proprietary uh, network platform. So with that, is the state, are the stations OCPP compliant truly or fully, I, I ask, because what I found is some of these uh, hardware manufacturers will also have a network, um, provided on network, what they do is they're able to manage any other station, but they don't allow other network platforms to manage their stations. So if a utility is looking to expand on the, you know, they get ABC hardware, XYC hardware, then they wouldn't be able to manage both, pick a third party uh, network provider to manage them. So I was wondering if that was, if, if the, I think it's the juice network that you call it. it. Mm -hmm. And so if that, those stations are truly OCPP compliant or only one way, I don't know if you know that. I, I don't know, to be honest. I. But uh, but yeah, my understanding is that software will only work with their chargers. Oh, okay. And and, and I guess that that's a, a concern that we have as a utility because we want to make sure that they're truly OCPP compliant. So as you expand, you know, you can have anybody manage your, your network. But again, some of the larger manufacturers, at least on the level two, they only manage their own and others, but they don't allow anybody else to manage to their stations. Right. Thank you. But I think the way I, I picture it working, it, I mean, they're kind of the middle, right? So most people are going to use an app like PlugShare to find the charger, to know where they're going. Um, I mean, Tesla is easy, right? When I get in the Tesla, it knows where its chargers are. It's going to tell me where, where to go charge. But um, with all these other chargers, there's PlugShare is the app that I've used. And so... Most of the time, I don't think people will be swiping a credit card. They'll be using the PlugShare app to pay. 
and then it will um, then go through the juice net to to collect that from plug share. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. I also wonder just as you manage the stations, you may not be able to have one platform that is able to manage all for you to get your analytics and uh, from the station. So that, that would also be a, a concern if they're not truly OCPP compliant. But yeah, you're right. They're probably used a third party app like PlugShare to for customers at least to interact with the station. Thank you for the. Other questions? I guess this would be a question. Uh, well, not to single you out, but maybe you or Joe or like other Oregon folks, if if you have, you know, an idea or a guesstimate to, you know, what these charging stations in Oregon are generating in Clean Fuels credits, or, or you know, approximately in dollars, like when that's monetized, what you might be looking at. Soon as we get a fast charger, I'll let you know. <laughs> Thanks. You talk about residential, but I don't know about the DCFC yet. Yeah, it's interesting. I think you know, Energy Northwest and and Fall River are really in are uh, you know getting into an area that isn't isn't very common. In Oregon, we have the all these West Coast Electric Highway uh, chargers, but I think it's very uncommon that utilities in Oregon own their own fast chargers. I think uh, maybe Clats can I. PUD, I think they may own some of the ones they have, but it's pretty rare. Um, this is one from EWIB again. Uh, so we're, the, the cost that we're, not the cost, but the benefit that we're seeing is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour through clean fuel credits. So when you, when you give a, a kilo, that's within our service territory based on our credits, based on how much they are, um, it's about 13 cents. So if we provide a kilowatt hour, we pay our own utility six cents and change plus the man cost. And we get about 13 cents per that kilowatt hour. So we're looking at our own DCFC infrastructure, and we're definitely considering that benefit to ensure that we pass a really uh, very accessible cost to customers when they use our DCFC, our future DCFC. That's something we haven't talked about in this discussion is sort of the cost of, of kilowatt hours through a DC fast charger. You know, when people are charging at home, they can be anywhere from, you know, 10 cents a kilowatt hour here in Portland to less than four cents in certain places if you're in a mid-sea you know, kind of area in, in Washington. So um, Jenny, what are the kind of ranges of, of dollars or cents per kilowatt hour that you've seen on DC fast chargers? So um, it's still kind of all over the place as far as how the vendors are charging the consumers. And I'm, I'm not trying to take myself out of it. <laughs> Um, but when we started with Green Lots, we kind of went on their recommendation as far as there were nine stations and they had all different ownership, but they wanted to keep them all consistently priced. So they were um, charging 35 cents a minute. And that's a little problematic um, just because it slows down at the end. And so if there's whatever constraints then it takes longer to charge the people pay pay more but they get less and so um especially with the uh, the washington state department of agriculture rules about um, interoperability and accessibility for chargers it's going to have to go to uh, per kilowatt hour and so we're looking at those in all of our models to try to make them uh at least fair for the consumers, you know, we still have to have this, um, you know, they have to be able to pay for themselves. So, um, so you know, so a combination of a, uh, a base session fee plus a per kilowatt hour fee to hopefully still be better than 35 cents a minute um, is, is our goal right now. And then if, if the um, clean fuels credits create, you know, savings for us or we can bring those costs down, then we will, they will be able to adjust accordingly. Um, as a, an electric vehicle driver who plugs in at home every night for six and a half cents kilowatt hour or something like that, um, I can't remember, I, my car is a plug-in hybrid, so I do have to get gas on occasion, but I can't remember the last time that I did. It was pretty much before this crisis, I know that. Um, 
So I, I feel like as a consumer, it's okay to expect to pay a little bit more at a DC fast charger because I'm seeing huge savings every day by plugging in a home. So try to keep that in mind. We can't, can give it away as a, as a public agency, but we do want to be fair and competitive because eventually there'll be, there will be choices. People can charge somewhere else if they're, if it's less expensive. I've certainly seen prices, you know, in the 30 cent to 50 cent per kilowatt hour range on a DC fast charger. And so a, a fill of your battery might be similar to the cost of filling a gas tank for a similar amount of miles. And then of course, you know, charging at home is the best way to go. It's the cheapest. So I do see your mic at Columbia River PD in Oregon says they have four DC fast chargers, soon to be six. So that's excellent. Uh, coming down to the end of time here, any any other questions for, for Jenny or for uh, Clint or just in general? I have a real quick question for folks. Um, and this applies less to highway corridors, but it, it may, you know, nice thing about fast chargers is we can try and stack value on it. If you serve a fleet and serve even you know, different purposes, you can help pay for itself faster. But uh, for folks who don't have a garage or don't have a power at home, you know, to be able to do level charge to charge at home, have any utilities been considering, you know, a different like a subscription plan for their members who, you know, and I know demand costs money, so not saying that that's free and, and demand charges are there for a reason, but, you know, addressing equity in that way for folks who might live in an apartment or just aren't able to charge at home to try and levelize those costs. Folks, it is something that we have we're exploring. I don't, haven't got very far on the answer. The best the best way to model that, um, and it would not be necessarily something like for us because we're more you know statewide without having a smaller region. But something that we could we could share with uh, our members that could be beneficial for them and their customers. But uh, yeah, I haven't, haven't got the plan together on it, but I, I think it, it could be helpful, similar to the way that people can opt in to you know, get renewable energy or what have you from their utility. Thanks. Excellent. Well, we are, we are at time. Um, I wanna thank Jenny and Clint and Jeanette and John for, for participating. This has been a great session. Um, thank you everyone for attending. As Ashley mentioned, I think the, the session is recorded, so it will be available. Um, and we will um, be scheduling another roundtable probably in July or so. Um, if you have any thoughts on topics that you'd like to, to learn about, um, happy to email me or, or email forth. Um, thank you everyone for attending and, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you.